The following video was recorded during ArcFig's 2015 OCD and Anxiety Week seminar. To see more segments from this exciting yearly event, or to learn more about ArcFig's helpline, support group, recovery programs, and community and professional education training, please visit the ArcFig website at www.arcfig.org.au. So our next speaker is Tom Bobian. Tom is a clinical psychologist who has worked with clients of all ages. He has experience in community health, hospitals, general practice and prisons. Whether facilitating groups, working with individuals, couples or families, resilience is a constant theme in all of the therapeutic work that Tom does. And Tom is also uh, very pleased to say that Tom has been uh, a very big part of our Arctic family as well over the years and uh, it's lovely to be see, see you now working in the field. So please welcome Tom Wadey and he's also a board member. Okay, I'll um, notice we're taking today so I'll try and contain myself to this area. Usually I'd like pace around and stuff, basically as a way of managing my own anxiety. Um, I was talking to Renee just a moment ago about the length of this morning's presentation. Um, initially the intention was to do 45 minutes. I'll keep it a bit shorter um, to give Lou Cooper um, a chance to do uh, some of the great stuff that she will next. Um, you're not missing out, right? The, the content that I'm presenting today um, is flat out stolen from a, a, a treatment program that usually runs over a period of nine months, right? So this is the broadest possible overview um, of this stuff. Um, and if you're wanting more information on it, um, you're welcome to Google and read and of course ask me questions at the end. Um, but I suppose that the kind of longer subtitle for my presentation could, today could be things that might help you be less unhappy, right? The resilience um, ultimately is not about, oh, excuse me, Resilience is, is not about a sense of pleasure, right? It's not about a sense of things going well because most people actually do quite well when times are good. Um, and when it comes to kids in particular, right, most people, most parents, and Lisa spoke to this really beautifully before, um, want things to be great all the time. But that's completely unrealistic because sometimes life isn't like that. Nasty things happen, we all have painful experiences, that's just part of life. It's one of the inevitable challenges we all need to face. And so there are things that we can do to um, assist with that. Now, I have very few slides. My intention um, is really to take as many questions and have an open conversation with you guys as much as possible. So please jump in. Um, if at any point uh, you have a specific question or you want me to take things in a specific way, uh, please do so, right? Because the I suppose I don't have the, the kind of um, extensive experience and research background of Rod. Um, you know, my thing is more about, I suppose, embracing the chaos of the situation. Um, and yeah, this uh, presentation is intended exactly along that way. So some really simple stuff, right? And a lot of this content, again, you could almost lift from like a year seven health class, right? Early high school, late primary school, hydration, diet, and exercise. So none of this stuff, again, will definitively help a person feel good. Most of this stuff will help most people feel less bad. And that's what resilience is fundamentally about for me, right? It's about being able to have a tough time and being okay. You're probably not gonna enjoy the experience, but as long as you're good enough, that's fine. That's what we want, right? It's the difference between everyday unhappiness or unpleasantness coming through a difficult time, as opposed to developing some kind of disorder, be it mental, physical, social, otherwise. Um, now, in the, the kind of Western medical tradition, we separate mind and body, right? That we have this concept of, uh, of your, your kind of mind as being almost outside of your body, right? And philosophically, this is called a dualist perspective. It's like the, almost like the soul is separate um, to your physical being. But that does not play out in all cultural spheres um, and even in the, I suppose, some of the kind of uh, bordering Western cultural spheres in the German medical tradition, for instance, uh, psychiatrists are also trained as neurologists, right? So they are doctors of the mind and doctors of the brain simultaneously because these two concepts are, of course, the same. The experience of mind is different from the experience of body, but your mind is in your body, right? It is part of your brain and the things that you do to your body impact your mind. So we could summarize this entire slide by saying, live healthy in the way that you already know how. 
right? Don't get overly complicated by it. Drink enough water, you should pee clear at the end of the day. <laughs> it's a simple little guideline there. Uh, you know, eat well, food pyramid, right? Whatever version of the food pyramid you're running with. But basically, eat a lot of healthy food, eat a little bit of unhealthy food because it's delicious. Um, and yeah, like pay attention to what your body's telling you. If it's not going well, if you're recurrently unwell, if you're carrying too much weight, if you're not carrying enough weight, you probably need to change your diet. It's not a complicated statement to make. And that's a big theme here, is a lot of this stuff is very, very simple, and a lot of this stuff is very, very hard. Because if it was easy, everybody would do it. And I think the rate of obesity in Australia, at, some, at the moment, is somewhere between 60 and 70%. So the vast majority of people in this country don't get this balance right in at least one part, right? And that also is fine, as long as it doesn't get in the way. Right, you don't need to be perfect. Again, Lisa made great points around perfectionism. These are not universal rules, right? No one's gonna send you to jail if you don't drink enough water on any given day. And you don't need to drink exactly eight glasses of water or whatever on any given day. Pay attention to what your body's telling you and run with it in that way, right? If you've had two glasses of water, being clear, it's all fine, you're fine. Don't overcomplicate the situation. Just allow yourself to rely on the knowledge you already have. Uh, and when it comes to exercise, whatever flicks your switch, right? Zumba, fantastic. Go for a walk. Uh, excuse me, go for a walk, go for a swim, ride a bicycle, do boxing stuff, whatever weird and wonderful abstract experience you want to have. And I mean, really, I think if you can incorporate this into other activities you already have to do, do that. Make, be, do this in the laziest possible way. Dedicate as little possible energy to this stuff as possible. Because you have other things, you have whole lives, right? This can't be your entire existence. If you focus solely on maintaining health and well-being, ironically, you'll probably go crazy. That's the way it is, right? And I have a slide on this later on, which is don't think so much about yourself. <laughs> because if we spend our entire time self-focused, uh, Rod talked about it in terms of self-obsession, Lisa talked about it in terms of spending a lot of time ruminating and whatnot, that's actually incredibly unhealthy. We're not wired up to do that. We're wired up to survive, right? This is what our bodies are good for, and that's not always the challenges we face in modern society. Sleep. We, we so often underestimate sleep as a um, really simple, really hard, really important intervention. So in psychiatry at the moment, um, our kind of biggest class of medications that are prescribed are what are called SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. Um, and we've developed as a kind of broader psychiatric community about a million of them, right? There's heaps and heaps of these drugs that all roughly do vaguely the same thing in a kind of different way. And no one really understands why they work. There's something about serotonin there that's related to lifting mood, but it clearly it's like it's spread out over the whole brain and we don't really understand why. We don't understand why you start prescribing these and the mood thing doesn't kick in for like two to eight weeks. Right? That's a kind of weird way of going about it. One theory is that all antidepressants as a common theme help regulate sleep. And you probably know from your own experience, if you wake up and you're happy and you're refreshed and you don't feel tired, you're energized, you're probably gonna have an amazing day, right? You jump out of bed, you're like, wow, this is unusually good sleep and I just feel raring to go. And you take energy and you take focus and you'll probably do really well at whatever's going on for you. Conversely, um, if you are jet lagged um, or you had caffeine at like the wrong time of day, or you know, someone woke you up repetitively during the night um, and you wake up cranky, you'll, be, you'll struggle in terms of your like, intellectual processing. You know, if we were to measure you on an IQ, you'd look a bit dumber on any given day. And it's like, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with your brain, right? It's just you've got less energy to pump into those kinds of exercises. Um, your emotions are likely to be much more wild and variable and you're probably gonna struggle. You've got less attention to spend. You've got less energy to spend. You know, you're, uh, the difference between a good day's sleep and a bad day's sleep could make the difference as to whether um, someone who looks like me would assign you a clinical diagnosis, right? Just on the basis of sleep. So if you can get sleep right, it's not necessarily going to make things good, but it'll hopefully make things less bad. 
Now sleep's a bit of a toughie to work with because of course, the more you try to sleep well, the less likely you are to sleep well. That again, we have this kind of irony of uh, pouring in energy um, and getting less result than we would otherwise. So really it's about building routine, going about it in a calm way. And another big theme of this presentation is accepting that it's not gonna go well to start with, and that that's fine. That like Rob was saying, you build your own success. That what we want is a less crappy experience on a regular basis, acknowledging that it's not gonna be a smooth transition, right? That if we were somehow able to graph um, sleep quality, uh, that you know, bad sleep quality is up the top here, you kind of expect it to jump up and down, up and down, up and down. And the broad pattern is that it improves over time as you do different things, like go to sleep at a regular time, have a, a basically build a little cave for your bedroom, right? It should be cool, it should be dark. And the only things you should be using your bed for are sleep and sex. And this is, sex hopefully not so much of a factor for kids that you're working with along these lines. Uh, but this is the, the same principles that apply for adults apply for children here. And I give exactly the same kind of content or advice to my adult clients as I do to my child clients, right? Um, Avoid screen time immediately before bed. Most screens um, pump out a lot of light in the blue spectrum, which essentially communicates to your brain, you are looking at a big blue sky, and that means it's the middle of the day, right? You're kind of lightly jet lagging yourself if you spend a lot of time on a screen immediately for, before bed. Try to read a book instead, or do something else. Um, a really obvious one, be tired, go for it. With the screen time thing, mm. having a teenager. Yes, they love the screen. Well, they do, and they love to then use technology to argue the toss about. You can nice. get this other sort of screen. Oh, lovely. That's it's clever. It's very true. Yeah. Therefore, it's okay. Nice. And look, like a Kindle, fine, right? Because okay. it's not a projected screen. Um, it requires... Um, no, no, you can't. You can only read books. It's just an e-book reader. Um, and yeah, look, there, there may well... Um, be screens that are coming out uh, at least designed to cater for that. Uh, what I would do is refer you to Google Scholar, right, which restricts the search terms to peer-reviewed scientific journals. Yeah. Um, and if there's stuff in there that says, yes, yellow spectrum screen has come out um, and it does in fact disrupt sleep less, that's fine. Important point though, if your teenager's sleep isn't more disturbed than a normal teenager, and I'll talk about that now briefly, um, don't worry about it. It's not a problem if it's not a problem. You don't need to do all of this stuff all the time, right? You only need to do it if it's getting in the way. It's the times where I'm not functioning in my life where I have to dial this stuff up, basically dial up my self-care because I need to compensate for whatever else is going on. Could be stress at work, could be stress in family life, could be physical illness, right? I've had a horrific cold for the last month. And so I needed to do a lot of this stuff. I took much better care of myself than I normally do. Because this, most of it, is pretty boring. And I don't want to do boring things, I want to have fun. <laughs> and that's fine, as long as it doesn't get in the way. Um, coming to sleep patterns, by and large, uh, when you are a newborn baby, you sleep, I think, somewhere in the vicinity of like 16 to 20 hours a day, right? Little babies spend a lot, a lot of time asleep because their whole bodies and their brains in particular are just like exploding with growth and that's amazing and they need to power down really regularly just to put the energy into that like cell division process um, and then by and large what we see is a kind of dropping off of the, the amount of sleep a person needs into adulthood around about 25 when the brain finally kind of settles down in terms of its rapid growth pattern um, and most adults on average right so could be less could be more will sleep in the vicinity of eight hours Right, if you're an adult and you're sleeping nine hours a day and it's not getting in the way of your life, it's fine, don't worry about it. If you're sleeping four hours a day and it's not getting in the way of your life, it's fine, don't worry about it. Now, a key piece of um, a research that started coming out about oh, five, 10 years ago now is that when folks hit adolescence, about 13, 14, just after onset of puberty, um, what we actually see is an increase in the need for sleep and also a shifting of the time clock so that teenagers Basically, lots of them are jet lagged constantly, being in the same time zone. So there's some uh, policy arguments out there for a later start time for high school, um, go from nine to 10, um, so that kids can just get the extra hour of sleep that they need. Um, and this is perhaps why it's not unusual that a teenager who goes to bed at nine, 10 o'clock, gets up at seven, goes to school all week, will then go to bed maybe just slightly later on a Friday night and wake up at one o'clock in the afternoon. 
you know, they'll sleep a solid 16 hours, no worries, and that's probably because they're catching up on sleep deprivation from during the week. And again, if it doesn't get in the way, it's fine, right? There are no universal rules around this stuff. You're not going to prison. It's not a problem if it's not a problem, right? If your kid's going well enough, if your student's going well enough, if they're being a pain in the ass teenager because they're a pain in the ass teenager, let them be a pain in the ass teenager. They will come through adolescence, like, almost certainly. Right? Time is good like that, but it really does keep moving. Right? They will have to move through eventually. And everybody probably looks back to some degree on their adolescence and goes, wow, I was a real wanker. <laughs> and that's fine. Right? It's a normal part of the human experience. And that feeling of regret or shame or whatever you have around that experience is educational. Right? You're using your own emotions to identify your own experience. My, my last two points there are, in fact, one point. Um, I have a, a particular sensitivity um, to the, the statement, made me feel, right? You know, I think people can make each other feel things, um, and that, that is when one person's power is taken away. So we're talking kidnap torture, and of course, early childhood parenting, right? In early childhood parenting, I'm not equating that to kidnap or torture. Um, <laughs> one person has all the power, the adult, because in the, the, the words of the brilliant philosopher, Homer Simpsons, Kid, kids are idiots, right? And if they weren't, they'd be adults. This is why we don't let children drive or vote or operate heavy machinery, okay? Because kids are immature and we expect the adults to take control. Go for it. Children really have their own wisdom, though. So if we're not, you know, ruling them on high, yes. we've got all the control, yes. they're not going to react because they do have their own responses. They are their own person. And I love that statement in terms of, I think when you're seeing that pattern of a child buck against your authority as a parent, you're probably getting a sign that that child is ready to take some responsibility in that area. I wouldn't be immediately... They used to. They know yeah, yeah, they know exactly, yeah. And that's perhaps the difference between taking responsibility for dressing the child adequately and trying to take responsibility for when exactly to the minute the child should sleep because you're far better off I think, as you're pointing out, to respond to the needs of the child and do it in that way. You don't have to be authoritarian right, in the way you exercise control as a parent or a teacher or, or whatever. It's about being perhaps authoritative, identifying the environment, identifying your lack of control, but the things you have influence over. So for me, instead of made me feel, I simply say, my, I feel, right? my experience is. I am reacting to because what that means is that suddenly my emotions are my own. It doesn't actually diminish the intensity of the emotions at all, but what it does do is pull them back to within my sphere of control. Whereas if I'm saying my child is making me feel this, then the kid is in control. If the kid is saying you're making me feel this, then you're in control of the child's emotions. And as comfortable as that might be in some ways, that is really problematic because you can't be around 24 seven. And if you're trying to be, your child has separation anxiety. Yep. Yes, beautiful. Which, yeah, was the, the point I was trying to make around use your words, right? communicate openly. And sometimes that's about asking questions, again, to figure out what the hell are we actually talking about here. Why? If it doesn't make sense, something else is going on. Yeah. Fill your day. Uh, spending all day, as I, I made the point before, inside your own head is not terribly good for anybody. Um, and this is why the vast majority of psychologists will encourage you to work or study or volunteer or do something. Have hobbies, have interests, have passions um, so that you don't think about yourself. It doesn't have to be something you enjoy, preferably not something you hate because that comes with strings attached, but there's no problem with being somewhat bored but at least engaged, right? It holds your attention well enough for, roughly speaking, eight hours a day, five days a week. Give or take. If you're doing eight hours a day, five days a week, and you're chronically exhausted, work less, right? Listen to what your body's telling you. If you get to the end of 40 hours of work, and you're like, man, I've just got, my head is just buzzing, and there's way too much space in here and whatever else, go and pick up a volunteer gig. Go and get a different job that has longer hours. Go and do sport or exercise that both ticks this box and gives you exercise, and hopefully promotes a healthy diet and whatever else. And now do something meaningful. Um, so this is about finding something that has, is attached to a sense of passion for yourself, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. Now as adults, it's probably relatively easy to come up with stuff. For kids, this is sometimes really hard 
because it's going to be very dependent on what their capacities are and that's something that shifts really really quickly that as kids grow a lot more possibility comes into here and that those interests are going to move really rapidly right a young kid is going to tick this box by doing a you know truly awful but really cute finger painting that same kid at age 13 probably not going to feel the same way. They probably want to be engaging in other kinds of activities. So again, have open conversations, understand what's going on, but attaching to a sense of mastery, of competence on any given day can ground a person who otherwise feels terrible about themselves to say, hey, at least I have this corner of my life where I know I'm okay. I know I'm good at stuff. It's a safe space in its own kind of way. And I make the point down there, uh, it should be a variety of things. It's nice not to have all the eggs in one basket. If you're really, really great at sport, fantastic. Go, do a heap of sport. The problem is you are going to get injured and you're going to get sick because that's the normal human experience. And then all of a sudden the mastery box can't be ticked anymore. That space is missing. So diversity is a really important factor here. Closing thoughts from me because I'm running out of time desperately quickly. Everything in moderation, including moderation itself. <coughs> when we talk about work-life balance, the aim is not to give you a sense of like a perfect pinnacle or fulcrum on which your life should teeter back and forth. It is a broad zone and a fuzzy zone and it moves around depending on where you're at, what your life looks like, what the people you care about, what their lives look like. And you'll know from your body, right? Listen to your body, listen to your emotions. Listen to your mind. If it's telling you that you're doing better than not, more often than not, right? That's exactly what it is, right? It's a pass mark on life for that time being by your own standards, okay? Because again, there are plenty of folks who will give you or try to give you like universal rules or guidelines for success in life. Uh, I'm gonna suggest to you that is rubbish and that if you want to invest in that, you are welcome to, but make sure you understand that you are adopting their perspectives as your own, rather than attributing their perspectives as the truth in capital letters. Nobody has a universal access to the truth, unfortunately. If that was the case, everyone would believe the same thing. Um, there is no perfect balance, I've talked about that already. Some days you'll be in the zone and it'll all be great, some days you won't, you'll feel like crap, you'll drag yourself through it and that's fine as long as it's not playing out to the degree that it gets in the way. And you don't need to do everything only enough, right? The last thing I would want from my presentation this morning is for everybody to walk away, um, arrange their food in a pyramid with eight glasses of water next to it while they walk on a treadmill and try to read, I don't know, philosophy or something like that while applying for jobs. Um, it's, <laughs> it's too much, right? You only need to do enough. You don't need to leave a perfect life because there isn't a perfect life. There's the life that works for you in any given moment. That will be different from you for every, than compared to everybody else, including your kids. And your stuff is gonna change, your kids' stuff is gonna change. And the kids' stuff is gonna change more than yours because they are growing faster than you are. Cool. Any final questions before we wrap up? Delightful, comprehensively covered all human knowledge. Thank you very much. <laughs>